In this documentary on the European Union, we shall explore the impact of Brexit and the uncertain effects it shall have on citizenship and human rights that have been a prominent feature of membership of the European Union. As Britain anxiously awaits withdrawal, we explore the perceptions of those it will affect and those who will steer its course. Leaving the EU, what can we really expect? Yes, I'm very sad. I'm very sad for, for our country, um, for, for Europe, uh, for the world, actually. Well, at 20 minutes to five, we can now say the decision taken in 1975 by this country to join the common market has been reversed by this referendum uh, to leave the EU. Nobody wants to listen to you. They don't think you don't want to listen to you. This will be a victory for real people, a victory for ordinary people, a victory for decent people. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. As well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends, or of thine own were, any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Legal European citizenship was codified by the provisions of the Treaty on European Union in 1992. Citizenship is defined by Article 20 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which sets out that every person holding the nationality of a member state shall be a citizen of the Union. In addition to defining who may be recognised as a legal European citizen, Article 20, Section 2 extends further to provide all citizens with the rights to free movement in the European Union. It is stated that citizens of the Union shall enjoy the rights and be subject to the duties provided for in the treaties. European Union anti-discrimination laws have been established in order to prevent discrimination, both direct and indirect, on the grounds of racial or ethnic origin, nationality, gender, religion and beliefs, sexual orientation, age and disability. The Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union was established in the hopes of bringing together the member states to create a close bond in which the common values shared amongst them could create a peaceful union at present and in future. The Charter offers itself as conscious of its spiritual and moral heritage. The Union is founded on the indivisible, universal values of human dignity, freedom, equality and solidarity. Evidently, this Charter shows the importance of establishing anti-discrimination laws and ensuring that Member States and its citizens are able to work and share coherently amongst each other to create a peaceful and harmonious environment. Human rights apply to all people, regardless of sex, race, faith, social status, or sexual orientation. They cannot be denied to any human being. They can only be limited in very extreme circumstances, and some rights can never be limited. Human rights came into recognition after the Second World War with the Universal Declaration on Human Rights in 1948. Following this Declaration on Human Rights in 1950, the European Convention on Human Rights came into being. In the UK, the Human Rights Act was passed in 1998, which made the rights set out in the European Convention of Human Rights directly enforceable by the government. Since its early inception, the European Union has evolved to develop strong legal protection for human rights. 
It is stated in Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union that the Union is founded on the rule of law and respect for human rights, demonstrating that the Union itself is a clear champion of the concept and gives it direct legal backing. Article 6 of this treaty further cements human rights in European Union law by giving legal effect to the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, a charter that lists six of the fundamental rights that must be legally enforced by all member states. Ironically for the libertarian of the Nigel Farage variety, human rights are the greatest defence against state power towards the individual. They allow freedom of the expression, rights to employment and are very much a shield to the identity of all human beings. They favour the individual and create an environment where differences can exist, excel and contribute in our society. Since the catastrophe of the Second World War, what has become the European Union has been at the global forefront of providing protection for these rights and there has been peace between the states of the Union since its formation. Enforced human rights defend the individual and allow the collective to prosper in equality. It is important to ask questions of the motives of those who would seek the removal of such important legal protection from our society. While Britain has a long tradition of being a champion in the area of human rights, many of the pro-Brexit campaign campaigned on the issue and suggested that rights prevented the UK from removing individuals whom are viewed as dangerous or a threat to Britain. The most prominent figure of the Brexit movement, Nigel Farage, has had this opinion on human rights. While concern over preventing racial discrimination in employment would probably have been valid 40 years ago, it is not today, Mr Farage was quoted as saying in a BBC interview. If I talked to my children about the question of race, they wouldn't know what I was talking about, he was also reported to say. He also said he would get rid of much of the existing equality legislation in the UK once we had left the European Union. While human rights can prevent radical characters such as the infamous Abu Hamza being sent back to their homelands to face torture and death, which can be seen as an inconvenience to some of our population, it is important to note that it is not in the public conscience that an individual should face torture for a crime or obtaining information, and the protection of certain rights must exist even for the worst individuals of our society. Human rights must exist, else we risk a collective return to a pre-war society, one in which employment protection and basic human rights are lost in the name of a punitive and an eye-for-an-eye eye justice system which will only create more conflict and fear. Human rights must be maintained, and it is of paramount importance that the future electorate realise the importance of these rights and elect individuals who will champion them in the future. Although many Europeans who were currently living in the UK previously felt as though they were protected by EU laws and were able to enjoy the core political rights it offered, they have now felt as though they are not welcome in this country due to Britain leaving the EU. Hi there, um, so we, we're just here on the protest that is held basically for the joint action against, you know, against the hatred towards the immigrants and we know that you came in here a long time ago and then you have a beautiful daughter that has been born in, in, in the UK and what are your views on that because obviously you've got the connection in here now it's not just your daughter it's also your link culturally you know in the UK so tell us tell us what do you think how, how do you think the government will protect you and I don't know at the moment I don't know at the moment so I I moved to the UK 27 years ago, uh, loved London, loved the UK, loved the fact that it was so multicultural, that was one of the things that really appealed to me. Um, and for this was born here, I still have my Italian passport, never applied to By the time it happens, it'd be 28, 29 years, they say you have to apply for the right to stay. 
And I was like, hold on a minute, I've been here 29 years. I think that's what just a that problem, mean? isn't it? It's just not, not yeah, knowing it's not if, it's going to, if it's going to be in the next two years that we're going to know what's going to happen. Well, what's happening currently is there's 1.2 million Brits living in the European Union and their, their status is also in question. Yeah. And you're in a strange situation where you're kind of being used as a political bargaining chip between our guys over there and the EU nationals in the UK. Um, and it's getting into a bit of a scrap about, well, if you don't give us rights, we're going to kick you guys out. We're going to kick you guys out. Um, how, do you, how, how would you feel if um, the Human Rights Act, for example, was completely just thrown out in this country? You were like literally. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a, a scary yeah. thought already because. Um, Regardless it, of Brexit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, if I'm correct, it's, it's kind of been in, in the works or already kind of scrapping the, the human rights. There's a lot of talk about yeah. taking away certain elements. Yeah, it? yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's funny. Obviously, for, for any human being, but then like my mum to have less rights than she's had for, for a long time, and then less rights than me, that's just weird. That's, fr that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's wrong. That would be wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a... And, and obviously, she's brought me up here. Like, I'm, I'm here because of her. She's here because of the EU. And my dad was here also because of... Well, the Commonwealth. Well, because of the Commonwealth. But that's what's so great. That's what should be so great about Britain, is that we all came here. And, like, I'm a mix. And I'm... British as a final result, you know. So um, yeah, it's just it's just weird to think that now she could be no, she less hasn't. important. Yeah, because the, we have an act called the Immigration Act, 1988, which guarantees you, as an Italian citizen, the same right as me, a British citizen, regardless. Now that that might change. Now, would you like British lawmakers to keep the situation? the same for those who have been here for a very long time? Or do you think it should just apply generally to everyone? I think I would like British lawmakers to realise that the referendum was only advisory and it was yeah. a very small majority and to know that they can still put a stop to it because it's, it's ridiculous, personally. Um, and it's made a lot of people who work here, pay taxes, contributed to everything, feel like they're not wanted. And I'm questioning my place. I, for many years, I was talking to my friends and my family back in Italy saying, oh, you know, we do this, we British do this, you know, we like our tea, we, we go to the pub. And it was always me because inside, I'm British, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't love it so much if I wasn't, if I didn't accept a lot of the culture and the history and the way of living. And now I don't know what I am anymore because I'm not Italian really in because I spend more than half of my life here and a lot of the way I think about stuff it's not that so I don't want to go back and I don't want to be here and not and, and be you know be demoted be, be from demoted. the first you know you need the you, you want the legal I want the legal, legal backing that you are that, that I've had so far because now they probably will ask all people that haven't got any permanent residency to actually apply for the permanent residency and then, you know, to have their indefinite stay. But Delete this from, from your video, but by the time they realise I'm not applying, I'll be dead because they have such a backlog anyway. <laughs> it's going to take them more years than I'm going to be around <laughs> to realise that, oh, hold on a minute. Yeah, me and probably me and others, but yeah. <laughs> I've got their scanners with their migrants and refugees that they are welcomed in here in the UK. Um, what is that? Obviously, you, are un you have anti racism view, and it's all protest is about welcoming migrants. Tell us about more about your views on Brexit and on the comments that has been made by the UK recently um, about them leaving the EU and about all the changes that they're going to implement. I think it's clear the way the referendum was handled, whether that's Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson, 
Um, David Cameron as well. I think both sides of the campaign uh, whipped up the most racist um, propaganda during that referendum. Very little did we hear about the running of, of the EU. It was all about the question of, of, of migrants. Um, I think that created a toxic campaign that following the referendum, we've seen just last week research show um, that London actually saw the biggest spike in hate crime. That's because I think racists have been emboldened by the uh, debate in the EU referendum. I think our job now as anti-racists is to try and pull the country back together. I think it's a minority of people who are racist and are trying to capitalise on it. For us, we're completely about pulling people together. Uh, on March the 18th, you and anti-racism day, we're organising a demonstration to bring the population out on a big march against racism. We see with Donald Trump's election the exacerbation of, of, of a trend of racist feeling confident and it's the job of anti-racists to come together to stand up uh, for the rights of migrants. We think it's a disgrace that Theresa May will try and use these negotiations to attack freedom of movement. We welcome um, the contribution that migrants from the EU and outside the EU uh, make to this country. The National Health Service, as uh, the pride of, of, of this country, could not run without uh, the migrants. We absolutely believe on March the 18th we want migrants um, everyone to come out and, and defend the rights of, of, of migrants. Um, and we think the government are weak on this question. They, they're in fights within both political parties. Um, this presents an opportunity for people to mobilise and, and to make it a line in the sand that we will not take attacks on freedom of movement because it's, it's too crucial that people deserve to have a right to be able to move around the EU um, wherever they want to live. British people live abroad, people should be able to come and live here. I'm Jim Fitzpatrick, Member of Parliament for Poplar and Limehouse and my office at Westminster. Um, hi Jim, thank you very much for your time today. Um, the Immigration Act of 1988 was introduced to ensure that EU nationals are not affected by uh, UK rules to immigration. Um, how is this going to be affected in uh, post-Brexit Britain? Well, I think the first thing to say is that nobody knows what's going to happen in respect of Brexit. Uh, we've never been here before. The only country which has ever um, left the EU was Greenland back in 1992 and there's no comparisons between that ex ex uh, exit and what's um, in prospect for the UK. So it's total speculation what's going to happen. Um, there seems to be a very strong consensus um, among parliamentarians who have spoken on the issue so far um, that we want to see EU citizens who are already here um, granted the rights that they've been enjoying um, since they arrived and citizenship as and when that's appropriate and many have already got those applications pending and some have taken out those uh, citizenship um, applications over the years so um, the Prime Minister has said it's one of if not the top item as soon as article 50 is triggered um, and we have a million to a million and a half UK citizens in Europe so there is an obligation for us to protect them just as there are European citizens here who want their rights and honoured also. So there's no guarantee anything, but it will be, I suspect, one of the first items that will be discussed. Um, thank you for covering uh, UK nationals uh, with you in Europe as well. My follow-on question was going to regard how the government's going to um, try and fight to make sure that their rights are maintained in Europe. Well, it's, um, it sounds horrible um, to to suggest that we're trading human beings here, but the reality is that because th there is nothing written down as to what individual people's rights are, because the treaties will all be um, um, unravelled, uh, we do need to make sure that our citizens have got their rights. Um, and to a certain extent, we have a bargaining chip in that there are European citizens here whose governments want to see their rights protected. So there should be, logically, a very simple and straightforward trading of recognition of the rights of both um, as citizens and a, a reciprocation agreement um, to honour the rights of, of everybody living in whichever country they have arrived at. And in that instance, it should be very straightforward, but it is a negotiation and nobody can guarantee anything at the moment. Thank you. Um, I'm next. I'd like to ask you questions about the asylum. So, um, the UK, under the Article 30, 78 um, of the TFEU, um, 
it is ensured that you know the citizens that come here, the non-EU citizens, are protected under common policy and asylum under the EU law. Um, however, with the with Britain leaving the EU, how um, how would it keep its humanitarian principles, and would it take on board any more refugees? I mean, it's already taken a few, I guess, a small number compared to other countries. What what are your views on that? Well, um, the Convention on the Rights of Asylum Seekers is, um, as far as I'm aware, a UN convention which was um, agreed by the European Union, agreed to by Britain. So. Um, the same standards ought to apply whether we're inside the European Union or outside the European Union because it's a United Nations Convention on Human Rights and the Rights of, of Asylum Seekers so there ought not to be um, uh, any different standards um, in respect of uh, what has been the procedure before and what will be the procedure uh, afterwards. Um, in terms of uh, the United Kingdom's uh, role and attitude towards asylum seekers. I think we've got quite a proud tradition in terms of dealing fairly with people who are seeking asylum. I can't see that that is likely to change. Um, Brexit um, should should be entirely separate from uh, asylum seeking applications and in, in that instance the normal conditions ought to apply. Thank you. And also another question is that under the protocol number 20 um, to, on the application of certain aspects of the Article 26 of TSEU to the UK and Ireland, nothing in EU law will affect the right of UK and Ireland to exercise frontier controls on persons entering from other parts of the EU and elsewhere. But after Brexit deal is concluded, do you think that the UK uh, will have even harsher border checks for the, e, for the EU nationals? Maybe it will be equivalent to those for non-EU, so what are your views on that? Uh, I can't answer that. No one can answer that. Um, if you look at the, uh, the situation between the United Kingdom and Ireland, um, that is our only mutual land border, and that's been an open border for over 20 years now. Um, and there are no checks and um, no, no difficulties for businesses to trade, for citizens to cross over. Irish citizens have had the right to vote in, U in, in UK elections for decades. Um, uh, they have more rights than other EU citizens um, who can only vote in certain elections. So all these different conditions are going to have to be uh, hammered out in negotiations. Um, and if we maintain the present arrangements or the existence arrangements with uh, uh, the Republic of Ireland, um, if then people from other countries use Ireland as an access route for Britain, um, these things will have to be considered as well. So um, uh, these are the kinds of issues uh, which will be taxing the brains of the negotiators from the European Union, um, including um, the Republic of Ireland, as well as from the British government. And nobody knows what's going to happen. Okay, thank you. And um, also, I have another if, for example, Scotland has another referendum and it's if, what, sorry? if Scotland has a referendum ah. and it's separated from the UK, um, do you think it would adopt the EU laws and how <laughs> it would adopt the EU laws and immigration as well? <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so this whole exercise so far has been um, a, an attempt to gaze into a crystal ball, yeah? Yeah. Now you want to gaze into a crystal ball yeah. which is shrouded in curtains. Um, who knows what may happen in Scotland? Um, if Scotland? One of the big questions for the Scots during the course of the referendum um, for their independence was if they went independent, would they be allowed to apply for a European Union membership? A lot of the opinion said that they wouldn't because if Scotland was allowed to get into the European Union, then uh, Catalonia, and Barcelona and the Basque region in Spain which has always had an equally strong um, uh, appetite for independence, uh, would then say to their people, we can vote for independence because we can do what Scotland's done and apply to the European Union for membership. And the expectation was always that Spain and the Madrid government would veto any application for Scotland. However, the Scots voted against um, separation because um, they felt their best interests were tied with the United Kingdom 
Um, if the United Kingdom leaves the European Union, Scottish exports, 80% of Scottish exports come to England and Wales. Um, if the Scots then join the European Union and cut themselves off from England, then that would be economic suicide as well. You know, these are um, questions that nobody knows the answers to. Um, the Scots economy is regarded as being very fragile, even more fragile than the, the UK economy at the moment. Uh, North Sea Oil has uh, been going. There will be a big interesting question for the Scottish Government in May when their review on fracking is a moratorium on fracking is due to come in because there are reserves of uh, shale gas underneath Scotland which could make Scotland uh, a more attractive independent economic proposition um, but they would have to change their mind on um, uh, uh, seeking uh, shale gas and to, uh, to actually get that out of the ground. So uh, nobody knows what Scotland's going to do. The latest opinion polls even last week said the majority of Scots would vote no to an, another independent referendum and the Scottish National Party won't call another referendum if they don't think they're going to win it. Thank you. Uh, no, I think all my what do you think the scope of the impact of leaving the EU would really be for uh, the EU, um, British who live and work in, in the EU? I mean, these are huge questions. And again, we've got fewer people in Europe than European countries have here. Um, but ours, um, many of ours are focused in uh, bigger groups, um, whereas we've got citizens from the other 26 nations in, in the UK and spread right across the United Kingdom, although most are probably living, uh, or bigger groups are probably living in, in London. Um, UK citizens will be equally nervous about what's going to happen to them as EU citizens are nervous here and I'm getting emails from my constituents saying they're worried about the future, they're worried that they haven't got any guarantees, they don't know how long it's going to take. Um, some of them have got citizenship applications in, they don't know what's going to happen to them. Um, it's, it's, it's a question that is on the front of everybody's mind, especially if you're the citizen involved, whether you're a Brit abroad or a European citizen uh, in the UK. <coughs> Nobody knows what the economic impact's going to be. Um, both sides traded worst case scenario. Um, the, the Remain campaign, of which I was a member and supporter and campaigner, we said that Britain's economic interest would be uh, worst served outside the European Union because that's our biggest export market. Um, that was our belief. Uh, nobody will know for maybe 5, 10, 15, maybe 20 years before we can look back and see what's happening. Um, the immediate reaction to the referendum last year was that the, the, pl the pound um, dropped 30% um, of its value and the stock market plummeted. Stock market's now higher today than it was in June last year. Um, all the economic experts say that the pound um, is going to rally strongly in the second half of this year and the stock market and the value of the pound tend to um, counterbalance each other. Um, these are short term shocks. Until we see what the shape of the negotiation is, until we see what the agreement looks like, until we can determine whether we've got access to the single market, what tariffs there might be, what the rights of different citizens are, what the trade arrangements are going to be with the EU and the rest of the world. Nobody can tell, and even then, you're trying to predict the future. It will be years before we can look back and say, how did the exports go? Um, how did the pound um, stand up to the battering it's been having for uh, the past six months? Um, historians are going to have to look at this. It would probably be too close to those of us who are living it until we get 5, 10, 15 years down the line. How, how have you gone about reassuring um, any EU nationals that might be in your constituency? I, uh, I can't. Um, I, I, I give them um, an, as best an assurance I can that there are many MPs up here. I think the majority of MPs up here who want to be able to tick the box for them. Um, I genuinely think that's the case across the whole house. Um, but it will be part of the negotiation. Um, all I can say to them is that we will do our best and it should be okay, but I can't guarantee anything. Now, what's the reason why you voted in favour of granting EU citizens' rights? On, 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 the, on the simple premise that it was a national referendum. The national decision was to leave the European Union. Um, my own constituency, I voted to, to remain, uh, but we lost. 
um, and from my point of view, to, uh, to disrespect the national vote would be to undermine our democracy. Um, you either believe in having a democratic system or you don't. If you don't, then fine, you can just tear everything up and say, we don't accept the decision. Um, there are people um, who will be campaigning to try and reverse the decision. Tony Blair made a big speech uh, last week. Um, when we had the debate two weeks ago, we have sent we put down a series of amendments to try and um, adjust the government's position, but we lost all those amendments. It doesn't mean we're going to stop trying, we're going to keep trying, and the House of Lords will start debating Brexit today and tomorrow. There's all, and, and then, when we finish all of our internal UK discussions, and the government triggers Article 50, which is what the people voted for last year, then there are two years of negotiations, and then there's a vote at the end of it as well. So there's a long way to go on this, um, and nobody can can predict exactly how, uh, how it's going to finish up. What potentially could the House of Lords do today that would help any UK citizens in the EU? I, I, think, the Lords, um, I think the Lords will make all the same reassuring noises that the Commons made last week. Um, but I think I would be surprised if the House of Lords doesn't also respect the outcome of the referendum. Um, but they will put down markers to say we are coming back to this as the negotiations the, uh, um, evolve over the next two years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, uh, the uh, European Convention of Human Rights is one of the most pivotal documents um, for protecting um, EU nationals. Um, there's been talk of a 21st century English Bill of Rights instead of the Human Rights Act. Um, Will this kind of be a carbon copy of that, and will it, would, would, do you think it would apply to everyone or just nationals? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen the thinking behind that. Um, the Brexit procedure is supposed to disentangle us from all of European institutions and laws, yeah. but the government said that we will pick up certain elements. Some we will um, uh, make domest into domestic law, mm -hmm. um, others we will adapt uh, and amend. Um, there's been discussions for decades, centuries even, about a uh, UK Bill of Rights, a UK Bill of Human Rights in, in modern uh, uh, jargon. Uh, we go back to Magna Carta in 1215. Um, nothing's improved upon that so far. There are some people who say, if you try and codify a Bill of Human Rights, you weaken Magna Carta and you undermine that which we've lived by for eight centuries now. Um, and to to try to, to improve upon that, to replicate that, is a huge legal challenge for whichever government uh, is in position. I haven't seen any um, any documentation saying this is the draft document that we yeah. might put in its place. Um, I'd be very surprised if anything comes forward. But hey, um, politics is about opportunities. There's no guarantee anybody's going to come forward. But with a whole range of different things. I can I can shoot a lot more questions <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind. Sure. <laughs> it's also about the legislation. It's mostly um, you know the the EU inspired legislation is part of the backlog in the UK society, and um, it concerns health and safety. Um, town and country planning, ecological protection, freedom of information, immigration, all of this aspect. What do, do you think will happen to the UK legal system um, after Brexit? Do you think, what, what, what are your predictions? Well, the, uh, some of that uh, legislation predated our membership of the European Union. The European referendum was 1975. Um, health and safety legislation passed in the UK was 1974. So we had um, strong health and safety legislation in place before we joined the EU. Um, freedom of information um, is as much a UK statute as a European statute. A lot of the laws are running in parallel. A lot of the laws we would have, we would have cherry picked. Um, what's worked in different European states or even the USA and codified it into UK law. Again, as I said to that a minute ago, the government has is, is said that we will have a bill which will repeal the Act of European Union but we will then be codifying all the bits that we want to keep in, U in UK law and basically re-establishing that. Um, and the government has said that they will give uh, assurances on basic protections, 
on citizens' rights, on trade union rights, on workers' rights, um, on health and safety and the rest of it. These are some of the discussions, debates and the battles that we will be having um, because obviously it is a chance for the UK government to be able to redraft how they want to see uh, UK law and one of the big uh, fears um, for uh, many people um, is that they will try to create a, a kind of Hong Kong economy um, with fewer workers' rights and fewer protections than we've been used to enjoying. Um, but if they were to do that, then there would be an almighty battle because people aren't going to surrender their rights just because the government sees that they've got, got an opportunity. Any more that people are going to give up their human rights um, or their entitlements simply because of some legislative process. It's, um, there are opportunities there for government. There are big challenges as well. And there are things that we've got to make sure that they, 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 they are unable to do. Do you think there would be, what do you think would happen to the common law, um, legislation, so that is judgments that have been based on the uh, EU law? Well, remember we've got English law and we've got Scottish law um, and EU law, so there are different legal systems working even within the, Euro uh, within the United Kingdom. So in that instance, um, uh, you need to talk to Nat's parents because they are <laughs> senior barristers and they've been much better placed to answer questions on what legal precedent um, will prevail after the European Union Article 50 is triggered, whether it would be European law, and at what point does it become British law, and at what point is it criminal law or common law, and what are the complications with the, the Scottish legal system? You need to talk to barristers about that. So the Immigration Act of 1988 was introduced to ensure that EU nationals were not affected by UK immigration rules. Um, as a practicing barrister, what's your view on how this would be affected once we're in a post-Brexit world? Well, of course, uh, current government proposals would likely to mean that unless there was something specific done, which is what the House of Lords are debating today, as I understand it, there may well be no uh, freedom of movement of both uh, people as well as goods and services in a non-EU member. I've been trying to think what it used to be like actually before we were in the European Union and it was quite easy to go across to France I think it would be harder uh, these days because of all the stuff about Calais and the um, refugee camps and everything so the question is what would it be easier or harder no um, there do you think that the rights of the EU nationals who are already here are going to be still protected under the Immigration Act of 1988? Well, you would certainly hope so, mm -hmm. those that are already here. So obviously people that have made their lives here in the expectation that there will be the ability to, to carry on living and working. You know, you move from anywhere. I mean, uh, London is one of the biggest French cities in the world now. So the answer to the question is, I would certainly hope not. That would be a major setback, and on top of other setbacks. And regarding our nationals who are living in the European Union, how do you think the European lawmakers are going to protect their rights? Or that may that be used as a bargaining chip? Uh, well, it, again, you would hope not. I mean, the, the, if they weren't going to be used as a bargaining chip, then uh, you would, it's difficult to understand why the government hasn't just said they can stay, because obviously then there'd be nothing to bargain about. Um, and you would hope that the same would apply to our nationals living in the European Union member states, with just huge amounts of Brits living in Spain. Uh, and you'd have thought it would be in the interest of those Spanish um, parts of Spain, those Spanish regions, to, to continue to have them there, because they're spending money, aren't they, in, in all sorts of ways. There's things like Gibraltar, which is a, a British, what is it, dependent territory, crown territory, belongs to the Queen, uh, and they're very... Um, concerned about it because if there is no uh, membership of the European Union for them through being part of Great Britain, then 
their border will become a hard border again, it's bad enough as it is at the moment. If it's a hard border, it'll be important for them. Because they all live and work, or well, they live in Spain and they work in Gibraltar a lot. Sorry, I digress. No. Next one. Um, I have a question um, about the uh, borders controls, the frontier controls. Yes. You know, um, under the protocol number 20 um, of the Schengen, Schengen Protocol, the UK and Ireland um, can exercise frontier controls on persons entering from other parts of the EU and elsewhere. Yes. Um, do you think, um, because now after Brexit, uh, Brexit deal seems to be, you know, on its way. Um, do you think that the UK will uh, have even harsher border checks for the EU nas nationals? So it will it will treat the EU nationals at the same way that non-EU nationals? Do you think that would be the case? Again, I, I would hope not. Uh, if it goes back to the way it was before, the United Kingdom joined the European. soft border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. It was, it was a, always a common travel area in my lifetime, it was always a common travel. You didn't need a passport to go to Ireland. Uh, how that works for, say, a German who flew to Dublin and then wanted to fly to London, Yeah. difficult to say really. How are you going know. to control How this? Would they know? <laughs> you wouldn't know. There must have been a way of them knowing, though. Uh, they do have the checks of the passports and the yeah. airlines. You know, mm. you know, even if you travel to to um, Ireland from here, they do have your passport in there, so they check. Yes. But it's not like a harsh, you know, like normal passport. It's not like a hard border. Yes. Yes. Like, yeah. So the same used to apply, maybe only to. land border in Ireland, the international border, there's a land border and to, and to journeys by sea. But I can remember going to Ireland um, and not uh, having a passport or a check. But that was at a time when there was a, there was more, you know, there was a, an armed struggle by Irish Republicans going on. Um, so in answer to your question, Again, I would hope not, but it could be the case. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be in the national interest for that to happen. Uh, but you know, if you decide to do something stupid like leaving the European Union, then your national interest is inevitably compromised. Um, and also, I've got the question about um, the asylum. Um, you know, because the because the UK is leaving the EU, and obviously. The articles that has been signed with regards to asylum will yeah. will be disappearing there. <laughs> let's say not directly, but indirectly. Um, but do you think that the UK will keep its humanitarian principles and will take on board any number of refugees? Uh, well, it's a separate treaty obligation, as I understand it, for uh, UK to take uh, asylum seekers. The attempts that are made to limit numbers um, must be legal within that treaty. I, I don't know. I'm not, that, I'm not an immigration lawyer, uh, but as I understand it, we, we have an obligation to take some asylum seekers, uh, and all countries who are signed up to that treaty. What treaty is it? Um, 1950s treaty. GFEU? Treaty of Function of the European Union? <laughs> It's part of a European obligation as well. Yeah, it's mm. Treaty of Function of the European Union, mm. Article seventy eight. Okay. But there is also a Geneva Convention, and you know th that is also in yeah. place for the people. Who yeah, stick I mean, obviously, if we we're, we're no longer if the nation isn't obliged to stick to the European Union articles, it falls back on other international treaty obligations which are in place. People sometimes forget about those because the European Union so much more important. But again, uh, it's um, something you would hope that would happen. Um, as 
a whole big, a whole other issue, really, huge issue about whether um, poorer people in rich countries can be persuaded that uh, a nation has an obligation, a rich country has an obligation to take uh, refugees. I mean, it's something that you know everyone, everyone's been let down on. I think they, you know, there's not enough support going to places which are taking the refugees. Besides the um, I have another question. Yeah. What do you think will happen to the common law, which has been and developed against the backdrop of EU legislation? Uh, I'm not sure. That's, hmm, how much common law has developed as a result of European Union membership? I mean, the, the one thing that was always going to be the hardest to harmonise was the common law systems, which are basically, I think, just United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, uh, everyone else has a Roman law code-based system, I think, in the European Union. So our, our, our common law system was always going to be difficult to harmonise, and the way in which, um, the, way in which the, the senior courts and the Supreme Courts in the UK have dealt with it is by saying, um, well, it's a question of interpretation of EU law, it goes off to the European Court for them to decide. Um, it used to be a lot more fertile than it was when we first joined. I can remember a lot of, um, when I started practice in, in the 1980s, you know, European law was always um, pushing boundaries because you look at the article um, uh, and the directive and see how the whether it was directly applicable or not, it was directly applicable terminations of the state. Did that affect local authorities? There was a big case called Marsh against Southampton. Does anyone hear that one? Good, because that was massive. Uh, and then I got a book. Is it still up there? Yeah. I got a book that was written by some European lawyers, Practitioner's Handbook of EC Law, so it was the European community then, and that was in 1998, and that little book told you everything you need to know about it. I think it's been superseded now, but things settle down. So, um, if we just, I think that the legal system will just have to uh, continue to apply our regulations which give effect to European law until those regulations are repealed and, and hopefully they won't be. Uh, what will happen is they'll just stop developing. Thank you. Yeah. You know you're talking about so no free movement yeah. and um, so what system do you think the government will introduce to manage migration from so the EU to the UK? From EU to UK? Yeah. Um, well, they'll probably try and do something uh, which means it's uh, easy for people who've got something they want, right? Skills and money, mm -hmm. and hard for people who they perceive as not having skills or money. Um, and quite how that judgment will be carried out. Uh, it's a kind of ghastly uh, nationalist. Um, manpower planning exercise, I suppose. Uh, and of course the fear is, as you probably all know, I'm sure you do, about who isn't, who's not there anymore to do the jobs that Brits don't want to do. Um, yeah. So they'll, they'll try and, uh, this talk of this points-based system, uh, which they claim works in Australia, well, Canada as well. And Canada. Is Canada the points based system? But here it's also like like for tier four is the point based yeah. system as well for tier four for students. For I suppose it, I suppose it depends on whether the points system is progressive and enlightened or not. You know, if it gives you points for I don't know, being from a place where they don't have many universities or a place where they don't have much employment, then that'd be one thing. But immigration control It's easy to control residents rather than people visiting, I suppose. Um, yeah. 
sorry, I'm not an immigration lawyer, you know, yeah, no, uh, to speak, for me to speak as a barrister about it um, is, is hard because I don't know the details of it. But in your expertise, in your specific area, yeah. um, how is Brexit uh, and the, uh, the movement of European law going to affect? Well, I do some employment work, not as much as I used to, because there's been a reduction in employment tribunal claims. Of course, it's massive in employment, because um, the harmonisation of employment rights um, meant that we have uh, a whole raft of protections that might not have been introduced. They might have been, you know, it depends, really. Uh, but you go back to the, you know, Tony, Tony Blair is one of the... Tony, big things that Tony Blair's first government did was to introduce the national minimum wage. Did Jim mention that? Well, that, that was a massive thing. Uh, it wasn't very much in those days. Uh, but um, uh, employers were saying, this is dreadful. You know, it's, it's, the, the, the Tories were against it. Uh, and now we just take it for granted. Um, and now we have a national living wage. Uh, so that was a thing that was you know, that, that could have been introduced anyway by a government who was committed to doing that kind of thing. Um, but the, the EU has, has relentlessly generated protections for more and more types of workers as well as just straightforward people who are on a, a wage or a salary. For example, one of the things I have done is there are uh, people who work as commercial agents for big companies and they're not employees they just go out and sell their products they're the rep mm. so one of my um, one of my lay clients was the uh, representative for the national sorry the London rubber company making surgical gloves and other rubber products and they you know he, he, that was his life he did it for 30 years and then they terminated him uh, and uh, under English law he would have had no protection at all because he wasn't an employee he wasn't a contractor, uh, he was just an agent who could sell their product. Uh, but under French and German law, they had protection, and that was um, an a, a EU directive, the Commercial Agents Directive, that we had to bring into law. And that gave people in that position, including you know, a couple of clients I've had, you know, chaps who spend their working life for these companies, and then they finish, and then they get some compensation to help them move to another job. So that was a good thing. Maybe it'll survive, maybe it won't. But that was completely new in English law. Uh, am I wandering off the point? No. Do you think there'll be a type like uh, uh, Jim said, there'll probably be a form of cherry picking of what's good and what's bad? Do you think that's going to start taking place? Well, in terms of employment protection? And, well, in terms of the European law in general, there's just going to be a, this is good, we'll keep this, this is bad, we'll get rid of this. Um, well, it all depends on the extent to which um, harmonise, and these things are, are there so that trade is harmonised, so that one country doesn't have a, uh, an unfair advantage in terms of the wages it pays and the protection it gives. So you, you don't get countries within the European Union who are not supposed to, which are um, treating their employees any different to get a commercial advantage. Paying half the wages, making people work twice as long, doesn't happen within the Union. Now, uh, whether we start doing that or not, uh, if, if our government decides that it's better for people not to have so much employment protection or employment rights, um, to give industry and commerce a boost, then they'll do that. No doubt about it. Um, it. Just depends on how far people get involved in trade unions, for example, who can argue to the country. Trade unions, historically, were against joining the European Union, but as soon as they saw the employment protection coming in to give the level playing field, they started to sign up to it. Not everybody, but most of them did. Trade Union Congress did. I think that uh, some of the cases in the English law um, are based now because of the decisions made in the ECJ, like especially on the collective bargaining. Um, yes, right. There was a Turkish case yeah. about the collective bargaining, and then 
the English law derived that precedence and put it in place yeah. in the UK law. So just because I'm talking about it, because I've got lecture next for the informal so. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, thinking about that, I mean, uh, a decision of the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeal on an issue like that would continue to stand unless it could be distinguished. Um, because that, that's the law until it's changed, whether it's a statute or it's a decision of a, of a senior court. The one that I was interested in, well, this is moving to my own mainstream field of practice, was the case about prison officers who were going to lose their homes. Prisons in, in England used to be like army barracks. Those, if you were a prison officer, you lived at the prison in uh, quarters, married quarters, they were called quarters. Uh, and of course that gradually fell out of favour and because a lot of these places were invaluable places like parts of London, um, the prison service wanted to uh, privatise them uh, and use the land to go pick up the receipt. Uh, and there's a case in um, Cyprus called the Arcos against Cyprus where the European Court of Justice held that, sorry, European Court of Human Rights, I mustn't make that mistake, but the European Court of Human Rights said that it was a, a breach of the employee's human rights to take away his government provided home. So we were using that case to argue that the prison officers shouldn't be deprived of their homes while they were still prison officers. Um, and the government uh, backed away from fighting that case. They, um, they never fought it because they knew they'd lose. Mm. And I never got a chance to go to the Supreme Court and win. Selavi? So it's like a freedom of association comes from the European legislation from Article 11. So that's like the participation in trade unions as well. So that also comes from the European law. Yeah, it was there before in England. We weren't, we weren't totally backward before. No, I didn't agreement. suggest that. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I mean, in, 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 the, in, the, in France, in Germany, in the UK, there was kind of age of enlightened Spain, Italy. Trade union movement started around the same time. And it depends on the degree to which you were industrialised. But there was big 18th century cases in uh, England that established the right of, um, of freedom of association against the things called the Combination Acts, which made it illegal to join the trade association, the trade union. Directly, they were all repealed. But it's just ba basically, you know, the attempt by the the noble attempt by the European Union to have a level playing field among its member states uh, was basically a pro progressive, not universally so, but it was progressive. I mean, you can't you can't make champagne in, in the Isle of Dogs, um, well, you can't anyway. But even if you could, you wouldn't be allowed to make champagne. Mm. You'd have to call it English sparkling wine, mm -hmm. and they can't make Cornish passes in France either. Does anybody know what the uh, designated English products are? It's Cornish pasties. Is it Stilton cheese? Wensleydale. Wensleydale. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So there are one or two. Don't know what's going to happen to them. Mm. Still. Uh, one final question from me. Um, the Human Rights Act. Yeah. So that was a big topic during the referendum campaign because lots of people viewed um, several articles as being able to protect people that the country would like to deport in normal circumstances. What's mm -hmm. your thoughts on what's going to happen with the Human Rights Act in the post-Brexit world, and do you think there will be a, a much, um, do you, sorry, do you think it will be easier for the government to just kick out whoever they want? Well, being a sign I think being a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights is a requirement of European Union membership. But you can be one without the other. And obviously, I, I did it in answer to your question earlier. You, it's often con the two are confused. And they were certainly confused. One of the confused things about the referendum debate. Um, pre 
previous Prime Minister, David Cameron, promised um, an English Bill of Rights to replace the Human Rights Act uh, in an extraordinary piece of political philandering. Um, uh, and I think that's rather gone into the long grass because the, the, the current party and government, the Conservative Party, are not, don't seem to be very keen on that anymore. It would be easier to get it through off the back of a wave of populism that's followed. Uh, but I think people who believe that that uh, European Convention on Human Rights, which was, I think, drafted by the Brits, um, you know, is something we should remain signed up to. It may, it, it, you know, as long as it has uh, direct... The big thing in 1998 was to make it directly applicable in English law, as opposed to having to go to Strasbourg to have a decision of the European Court of Human Rights on whether the UK government was in breach or not of the Convention. What um, Blair's government did was to make it directly applicable in English law with the Human Rights Act 1998. You could always do it, but it was, it was hard for people to do. Um, and it, it's got a bad reputation among people who are wrongly concerned about immigration, in my view, but um, it does much more than that. Much more than that. Um, so I don't know. I don't know about that. Uh, you know, the English Bill of Rights. No, it's kind of, yeah, it makes sense. It's kind of gone into the long grass, but there is concern about the Human Rights Act being scrapped. Essentially, yeah, there, but there, there is concern. But there's a cross-party opposition to that happening, and. Um, Mrs. May, who contends to be the champion of the underdog, uh, is unlikely to, to want to take that on while she's dealing with exit from the European Union. It's, it's a big job. I mean, we were all very excited about it. I, I, I even bought a book, there it is, a red one, <coughs> called The Law of Human Rights. And I was in a case which, um, somewhat to my surprise, very early on, it was called Wilson and First County Trust. And I went in at court of appeal level and argued the case for Mrs. Wilson that she should get both her money back and her car, which she pawned, because the pawnbroker had forced on uh, to the credit agreement something which shouldn't have been there. And it was a breach of the Consumer Credit Act, an English act. Um, and the Court of Appeal said, yes, you're right, technically. So she gets the car and she gets her five grand back. Uh, but um, we think this may offend the pawnbroker's human rights. Because it basically means, because we made a simple mistake, there's no relief for them. They've lent money and they, they've lost their security. And that went all the way to the House of Lords before the Supreme Court was started. Unfortunately, without me, because by the time we got to the second round of the Court of Appeal, the pawnbroker said, right, we've had enough of this. She can keep the money, she can keep the car. We'll, we'll just go and argue it with the big boys and girls, and you can just sod off. So that's what happened. And it was argued, you know what's interesting about that case, the war story? The day it was argued by the government with the Attorney General, Lord Peter Goldsmith, as their barrister, that, that morning he did Mrs. Wilson's case in the House of Lords, and he got round, went round to the 10 Downing Street and did his conference with the government about whether the Iraq war was legal. And we always think, what a great day Peter Goldsmith had. <laughs> morning, arguing Mrs. Wilson's case, about five grand, and a bit more than that actually, because it affected sort of poor workers, and then gets in the car, pops around and says, I think this war in Iraq's probably legal. <laughs> <laughs> London is the place for me London, this lovely city You can go to France or America India, Asia or Australia But you must come back to London City Well, believe me, I am speaking broad 
reminded me I am glad to know my mother country 